With Ukraine's counteroffensive mired by Russian mines and trenches, some officials in the United States are questioning Ukraine's recent and growing attacks on Russian-occupied Crimea. CNN's Katie Bo Lillis is covering this story for us. So, Katie Bo, what are your sources telling you uh, about these concerns about Ukraine targeting Crimea? Well, Alex, it's against the backdrop of this sort of stalled Ukrainian counteroffensive that Ukraine has in recent weeks started ramping up these strikes against Russian-occupied Crimea, right? They have used missiles to strike key bridges connecting Crimea both to the, to the Ukrainian mainland and to Russia. They've used artillery to try to strike logistics hubs, command and control nodes, uh, ammunition depots. And for, for Ukraine, of course, the goal here is to try to isolate Crimea, right? They want to make it more difficult for Russia to be able to sustain their military operations on the mainland. And of course, they rightly view Crimea as part of their territory, right? This is an integral right. part of the, the counteroffensive for them. U.S. military and intelligence officials that we spoke to said it's a little too early now to tell whether or not this sort of new strategy of striking Crimea is, is really going to achieve the intended goal of making it more difficult for Russia to stand up to this Ukrainian counteroffensive. But what we can say, Alex, is that at least in some corners of the U.S. government, behind closed doors, there's some real skepticism that this tactic is, is really a good idea. Um, among some military and intelligence officials that we spoke to, there's a concern that these strikes on Crimea are kind of at best a distraction and at worst uh, a use of, of valuable resources at a moment in which the United States is already broadly worried that Ukraine has kind of stretched itself too thin across multiple axes of attack. And so I'll, I'll share with you something that we were told by a senior defense official this week um, who said to our colleague Natasha Bertrand and, us, and myself, it's knocked the Russians off balance a bit, but it's not doing anything decisive, and it would probably be better for everyone for them to just focus on the counteroffensive. So does that mean that there are possible implications for the U.S. level of support for Ukraine? Well, certainly, Alex. I mean, the United States has spent $100 billion in support of Ukraine at this point, and we have seen from public polling that there are some signs of sort of some softening political support in the United States, right? Like CNN polling just this week showed that a majority of Americans now oppose additional funding for for Ukraine. Now, there are obviously partisan splits there with Republicans more likely to, to oppose additional support than Democrats. But um, I, I do think there's a real sense both within the U.S. military and certainly within Ukraine that the runway is not uh, endless here for Ukraine to kind of show some, some real gains on the battlefield as part of this counteroffensive. And I think if you get to the end of this year's fighting season, they're still stalemated. There haven't been any major breakthroughs. I think you're going to start to see some very serious and some very difficult questions about how do you try to get the Russians and the Ukrainians to the negotiating table. This is a, a major worry of the Ukrainians that what happens if they don't have success in this counteroffensive. Katie Bolos, as always, terrific reporting. Thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate it. For more on the story, I'm joined now by CNN military analyst Colonel Cedric Layton and McCain Institute Executive Director Evelyn Farkas, who is a former U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense. Uh, thank you both for joining us. Uh, Evelyn, I, I want to follow on some of Katie Bowe's reporting. When it comes to Crimea, do you think that this is an either-or question, that Ukraine should be training all of its focus on the counteroffensive, or is there a benefit to also hitting Crimea at the same time? Yeah, Alex, I don't think it's an either or or either or. <laughs> I think that they can hit those logistics hubs, the ammunition depots, all of the infrastructure that the Russian, the Russian troops in the east and the south rely on coming through Crimea, coming from Russia to through Crimea to the rest of Ukraine. So I think it is important to continue to target those areas, but at the same time, yes, they need to be focused on the counteroffensive. In the, in the south, they have two avenues of approach, and in the east, they have one. And I think that's what the administration has also focused. Katie also mentioned it. Katie Bo mentioned it in her earlier segment. You know, basically, the administration seems to want Ukraine to focus on one avenue of attack. So I'm, I'm not sure that Crimea is the bigger, the big issue. The bigger issue is the administration would like the Ukrainians to focus and punch through somewhere, punch through that Russian line. And they are trying to punch through that Russian line in the south. Colonel Layton, the Ukrainian defense minister, told me last month in Kyiv that their goal is to split that Russian land bridge in the south and reach the Sea of Azov. But Colonel Layton, how likely do you think that, that, is, that this is at this point? Because we're hearing from Western officials that they're increasingly pessimistic. 
Yeah, I think it's going to be a tall order, Alex, but not impossible. And all they have to do is if they reach Melitopol, uh, right in the middle of, of all of this, right in the middle of that land bridge, which is a junction of two major highways, uh, they will have achieved, the Ukrainians will have achieved a major victory. And I agree with Evelyn, you know, this is something that uh, I can be done uh, in conjunction with attacks on Crimea. In fact, it would be military malpractice if they didn't go after targets in Crimea. So it becomes really important for the Ukrainians, yes, to focus on their counteroffensive, uh, but they also need to make sure that they can uh, prosecute the war on all possible fronts. And that's going to be something that they'll need to do in this case. So what I'm hearing from you both is that they can and should be walking and chewing gum uh, at the same time. So Evelyn, beyond Crimea, we're seeing more of these drone attacks in Russia on, on Moscow, in fact, today. That forced stoppages at four major airports. What kind of strategic value do you think that these kinds of drone attacks have for Ukraine? Right. So first of all, the drone attacks have been targeting militarily, um, you know, military targets. They're not targeting civilians, although, of course, it has had an impact on civilians. And I think that that is also, from the Ukrainian perspective, an added benefit, meaning they don't want to hit civilians, but they do want to bring the war home to the Russian people, make the Russian people understand that the government is waging a war in their name that could impact them. And so I think uh, targeting those military sites in Russia, logistics, uh, manufacturing, anything that supports the war effort is, is completely valid, justifiable. And then the added benefit, I completely understand why they would want to make sure that the Russian people understand what their government's doing. So that, that is, that's what's happening in the Russian context. Of course, the Russians at the same time are continuing to bombard bombard Ukrainian civilians every day. Oh, we should note that those drones are, though, uh, hitting downtown Moscow and, and have been hitting some uh, civilian buildings, a, a business uh, center, for example. But, uh, Colonel Layton, we only have a couple moments left. I want to ask you about the, the F-16 training. Ukrainian pilots are set to start training on F-16s uh, later this month. Many, we are told, have little English skills and only have a few hours of flight time. So how challenging, uh, as an Air Force veteran, do you think it's going to be to train these pilots on these jets and then integrate them uh, into the combat operations? Well, Alex, language skills are going to be key, and combat experience is also going to be key. So at the, the best-case scenario, we're looking at January before these guys and, and gals potentially can fly uh, F-16s for Ukraine on the Ukrainian battlefield. Uh, that's a really early thing. I think it's going to be much later than that. Uh, so I, I think what we're seeing here is an effort to really uh, you know, move this training forward, but it's going to take some time, and we won't see anything before spring. At long last, there is movement on that front. Uh, we have to leave it there. Colonel Cedric Layton, Evelyn Farkas, thank you both very much.